Hello, it's Keith here. Um, this is going to be a bit of an addition to my Z80 tutorials. We're going to be doing a little bit of programming today, but the main reason for this video is I want to introduce the 8-bit um, system called the Enterprise, sometimes known as the Enterprise 64 or the Enterprise 128. Now, um, this is a request from one of my Patreon backers who asked me to go over one of the simple introduction pieces of code that I've written. Um, I can't really do a great job today because it's a system I'm not particularly familiar with myself, but I think I can probably show you enough to give you some maybe interest in the system and um, I do plan to go into it in more depth in the future once I've finished the beginner Z8TE tutorials that just cover the basic commands like with the Spectrum and the MSX, I'm hoping to include the Enterprise in the systems that I show in detail how to program. So today we're going to have a look at the system. We're going to do a simple Hello World example. Um, and I'm just going to describe what, I, what I've found about the system and why I think it's quite an interesting system that you should consider along with the more popular Amstrad CPC, MSX and ZX Spectrum. So, let's have a look. Firstly, I'd like to say thank you to ZozoSoft on the Enterprise Forever forums for these nice pictures here because I don't actually own an Enterprise system. They're relatively rare. I believe only about 80,000 were ever produced. So um, it's, it's one of the rarer, lesser known systems, but it is one that's worth knowing a little bit about. So here's our Enterprise emulator here. And I'll just um, start it up so you can see it goes straight to BASIC. So um, I don't know a lot about coding BASIC, but um, let's, have, let's describe the system and um, I'll tell you what's quite interesting about it. So the Enterprise um, system, it, it's got its own DOS system. It's, it's, it's perfectly capable of disk-based operation. Um, it can, um, it can support multiple disk drive, it can, su it can support memory upgrades. Now, when compared to the Amstrad CPC, graphically, it's very similar. Um, it's capable of a 320 by 200 screen resolution in four colors, just like the Amstrad CPC. It can also do a 160 by 200 screen mode in 16 colors, just like the Amstrad CPC. But it can also do a 256 color mode with 80 pixels wide by 200 pixels down. So um, immediately it beats the Amstrad CPC for graphics, uh, but it does have an even cleverer trick. Now on the Amstrad CPC, you can use software interrupts to change the screen colors at multiple, position, multiple positions down the screen. And this is how I, used the, how I did the effect in Chibi Akamas, where there were multiple um, color changes, and I was able to get about eight colors on screen like that on, in the four color mode. And there were other games um, like Renegade and Gremlins 2, which changed the um, screen mode to allow more um, more colors even than that, and, but of course reducing the screen resolution. And if you look at, um, I believe it was um, CargoSoft's um, Imperial Mahjong, they actually sque changed screen mode every single line to get the colors and the resolution. Now that's a very, very tough trick to do. Um, but all of, these, um, all of these screen mode changes do have a major disadvantage that you're using the Z80 CPU power to make these changes. So the more changes you make, the less CPU power you've got left for your game. Now the Enterprise is rather unusual because it can do this same kind of effect, but it can do it in hardware. So you create a table of memory references that tell the system what screen modes and what colors you want to use at the line level. So you can change screen mode every single line and the hardware does it for you, so you're using none of your CPU power at all. This is very, very powerful. And what's more, um, the, the Z80 in the Amstrad CPC is running at about 3.57 megahertz, I think it is. On the, um, on the Enterprise, it's 4 megahertz, so it, it's even slightly faster by default. Now, I've explained this screen mode um, thing, but I think we should have a little look at it. And there's a very clever program here called The Hobbit, which um, a user has written. So let's have a look at this. Uh, I can't even begin to describe how this works, but um, you can see here it, this has got the resolution of a, of a CPC mode one screen, but it's got color changes all over the place. It's very, very clever. So, um, you know, you, you could just never do this on the Amstrad CPC with, without, well, not on the regular CPC. I don't think the resolution would certainly be lower, but um, yeah, very, very clever. Now, um, we'll just move that out of the way because I just want to show you another um, another thing. Now, th the only real difference between the Amstrad CPC and the Enterprise that acts in, a, in the 
in a negative sense for the enterprise is um, where the Amstrad CPC, the Spectrum and the MSX all use the AOI sound chip, which is why I'm, I'm, cap I'm able to convert my GB Ackermann's game very easily to those of the systems. Um, at least in sound, the sound sense. Um, unfortunately, the enterprise does not have the same sound chip. I don't. I'm. I'm not an expert on sort of sound technologies. I. I can't really assess whether the enterprise is superior or inferior. But I do have a little sample I'd like to show you today, which is um, this rather curious tracker program that someone's written. And um, if we just start this up, and I'll just turn the volume up on my speakers a little bit. Now, this is um, quite remarkable to me. This is sort of one of these digital sound trackers. Um, now, I was familiar with these back in the sort of early 90s, but I was, I was, doing, but I was doing this on a um, PC, on a um, 386, 25 megahertz, and even then it was a struggle for the system. To, to see the same kind of sound being done on a Z80 system is absolutely incredible. So I don't know what the um, sound capabilities of the Enterprise are, but they are obviously... Um, they're obviously respectable because for it to be able to do this is really quite something and as I said before that um, it doesn't have the AUI sound chip which is a bit difficult for me porting my game to this enterprise system but there is an AUI sound emulator which does at least a reasonable job of converting the sound I'm not going to play that for you today because I haven't got the sound set the, the software set up quite right and I don't want to do the um, the system an injustice by playing playing it with bugs in my own software so we're going to skip on, skip through on that so I was describing the graphical system just a moment ago um, and we're going to go into a bit more detail on that now. So as I said, you can change screen modes every single line uh, and let's have a look at how the screen modes actually work in the system. So I'm just going to load another example now and we'll have a look at that. Okay, let's make a start. So we're going to be using WinApe. I do all of my assembly in WinApe, so that's our sort of starting point. And I'm not going to describe this first program here because um, this is just a little example that we're going to use to fill the screen memory. Now, I've talked about the screen memory on the Amstrad CPC and the um, ZX Spectrum before, and I just wanted to sort of show you how the um, Enterprise's screen memory worked. So let's just compile this. We're going to write straight to a file. And let's start our Enterprise emulator here. I just need to change test.com. This is probably a good point for me to explain how they've got this enterprise system set up. Now the enterprise is a um, has its own operating system which is relatively advanced compared to the other 8-bit ones to be honest and it seems to be able to work with multiple disk systems and multiple stream based systems and I'll explain why I'm describing it like that later. So um, what this version of um, this emulator has had done is it's actually had a an extra disk emulation layer added to it so that it can access folders on the Windows PC or any other PC for that matter as actual drives on the machine which is why I've got this file specified and this actually means a file on my system itself which makes development very easy and then you use this set working directory option to point to the folder that the disk system is mounting so if I do this now you can see my little example loads up just fine so we've got this little program here. Um, it's just going to do some stuff to the screen. I'm not going to explain it today because it's, it's a little bit complex and to be honest, I didn't write a lot of it. But um, let's just fire it up and have a look what it does. So you'll see it filled the screen there from the top down to the sort of the, the top bottom half. Um, and you'll see this, this color split here. And that's this thing I described about being able to change screen mode and color depth halfway down the screen. So what I've actually done is this is the equivalent of CPC mode one, four colors um, on the screen, but then I've changed the mode again halfway down, still to mode one, but this time with four completely different colors. Now you'll see that um, fill routine filled from the very top to the very, to, to nearly the bottom in a sort of linear pattern. And the rather unusual thing about the Enterprise, which is a, uh, uh, it would have been a logical thing, is all of the other 8-bit systems I've worked with, the, the, the screen lines, finding the next screen line is quite difficult because it, the next screen line is not the mem next memory position. But on the Enterprise, it is. It's actually linear. So y you go straight from the, this pixel here to this pixel here on the next line down in screen memory, which is really quite a, a pleasant surprise. Now... It's not even just that. I mean, that. That's a great thing in itself. But actually, you can reconfigure the screen 
in any way you want. So you can make the screen memory of the Enterprise exactly the same as the screen memory of the ZX Spectrum or exactly the same as the screen memory of the Amstrad CPC. So you can make the Enterprise emulate a CPC and then you can use your own your CPC sprite routines untouched, unmodified with the Enterprise, which is absolutely amazing. It's really remarkable how how it didn't get more software ported to it when it's got such flexibility and such power with regards to the screen capabilities. So anyway, that's, um, that's our little example there. So let's um, carry on then. As I said, we're going to do a little Hello World example today. So let's make a start on that. I'm going to do a, a bit of co copy pasting to make this a bit quicker because, I, I, as I say, I'm not massively familiar with this system and I don't want to make too many, many mistakes. So let's make a start. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to um, say we're going to tell WinApe to save to a file on our system, and this system is going to use the, the file program.com in this folder bldint. So that's we're just saving to that there. Now um, enterprise files need a specific header, and I'll just put that in. And what what we're doing here is we're starting our program 16 bytes ahead of of memory address and 100 and that's the space for our header because the, the program will actually load into memory at and 100. Um, you can see here the header starts with a zero and then we have to define the type of the file and this is a binary program that the, 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 the enterprise can run so we have to put this in otherwise the enterprise won't understand the file and then we need to define the file length which we're using two labels to do and then we just need to space it out so that we get for the 16 byte header and there we go so now we're um, ready to make a start. Now, one slightly confusing thing that threw me all over the place when I started working with the Enterprise is um, you have to make sure that the stack pointer is in the right position. And um, that's another thing I need to actually discuss about the Enterprise because um, the Enterprise, compared to the other systems, we'll just, sorry, we'll just hold off from the programming for just a moment. I described the uh, memory banking systems of the um, CPC the ZX Spectrum and the MSX before. Now the Enterprise actually has the most advanced of all of them. Um, as I said before, it can it can support 64K or 128K, but it can actually support a lot more. I believe it can go up to four megabytes or very close to that. Now, um, unlike the other systems where you have relatively limited options of where you can bank memory to, at least on everything except the MSX2+, Plus, which does have very advanced banking. But on the Enterprise, any memory bank can be loaded into absolutely any position of the address range. So, and I believe you can even have one memory bank loaded to every address range if you want. So you, you could have the same 16K in all the positions, which is strange but interesting. So um, you, you have a... a um, a bank that's used by the ROM for the um, settings. You have the low bank, which is used for the interrupt handle and things. The screen memory has to be in one of the basic 64K banks. But as I say, you can position any of the other banks anywhere in the system memory. But um, this does seem to cause some slight problems for the firmware with regards to the stack pointer. So um, when, when I start my program, because I'm using the system firmware, the best thing to, seems to be to do to allocate your own stack pointer and use that, that makes it safe. So all we've done here is we've put it just before the start of our program and that will work fine for this example. So I just needed to explain why we're doing that. And then we're turning off interrupts because we don't need them just to make things a little bit easier for us. Um, and then the next thing we do, we need to define our screen mode and we do that with this command here. So we're loading um, C with the, um, the template mode vid and then we're calling a function called enterprise write bar. Now let's get those in because we need to see what all of these are. So here's our variables here. Put them nice down here. So we've got these variables we're going to use and then we need enterprise write bar. And we, we will need a few of them later so let's get them all in now. So, now, if one thing I should point out, in my examples, I'm using RST6. You may see other enterprise examples which call this, um, I believe they call it EXOS. Now, this I find this quite confusing, so I've taken it out of my basic examples. But what they do is they have defined a macro in the assembly language which says, well, when I type in the command EXOS, replace that with RST6. 
that makes perfect sense for um, for readability and simplicity of coding. However, I like to use the basic Z80 commands in these in these beginner examples so that all of the commands you see are actually what the Z80 is running and aren't something that has been converted. So you will see in other examples this might be called EXOS11. Fine, but what it is actually doing is it's running RST6 and then there is a one byte elic command but there is one byte following that which is number 11. Now I haven't explained RSTs in my tutorials, they are coming very shortly. What they are is they are a call to a memory location in the first um, the first 64 bytes of the system memory. They're just a very quick sort of hardware coded call and they're used for system functions quite a lot. And RST6 on the enterprise is, is this sort of system call for all of the enterprise operating systems functionality. So that's all that is little bit confusing but just bear with it. So I've created these functions which I call to run basic commands. So this one will read an enterprise operating system variable. This one will write one and we need this so-called special function for um, for setting up this, the um, screen memory correctly. How do you know about these? Well what you need to do is there is a technical document which I will give you a link to. Um, you have to download them and then you can look at all of these manuals and you want to get this warp mode one and um, what what um, what you have to do is you have to read through them for what you're trying to do and then figure out sometimes quite painstakingly um, how to actually get the system to do what you need so you, you may sort of need to see display control and then you can see all of the options of display modes here and if you read through this and you figure it out, eventually you will be, be able to understand what it is you're trying to do. And it took me a long time and that's why I've created this simple hello world for people so that they can at least make a start without having to spend that time. So let's carry on with our program then. So the first thing we're doing is we're selecting mode zero, um, which is basic text mode. And then we need to select color, the color mode and we just need two colors which is which is color mode zero in um, in the enterprise operating system so our next command is we need to set the width and we set the width to 40 characters which is a, an Amstrad CPC size screen and then we're setting the height and we're getting we're just setting it to 24 which is actually one character smaller than the Amstrad CPC but um, no matter and then now the next thing we're going to do is um, kind of the key to understanding how the enterprise operating system works. I said before about files, the, the file label being a, um, a stream from the physical disk system of the, of the Windows system. Um, and I said at that time that it wasn't just disks that were streams. And that's kind of the key, you see. The keyboard, the screen, everything on the, on the enterprise system is opened as a stream by the operating system. So if you're using the operating system to do your graphics, you have to open it as a stream and it looks a bit like a disk open command and you write to it a bit like a disk open command, which is very strange. But once you get used to it, it does work quite nicely. So let's carry on. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna load up the screen and I've actually allocated it as stream number 10, which is what this, this command here is. So I've given it number 10 and the simple reason for that is I didn't, I wasn't sure what other streams might be in use by the system when I was doing my testing. So I thought, well, maybe one and two are in use. So I'll start at 10, that's probably safe. Um, I, I don't think one and two are in use. As I say, I'm not that familiar with the enterprise. So I'm, I'm having to make a few assumptions just to get myself started. So <clears throat> now we need to know what this screen name is. And um, this is another variable that I've kind of defined here. So let's copy paste these in down here as well. <clears throat> so just like my file command, <clears throat> you can see I've, um, I've defined them and we've got video here, video colon, the colon is necessary. Um, and then you've got keyboard colon because we're gonna read from the keyboard as well. And this number here is the length of the string. Um, the enterprise system requires the length to be before the actual data. So it's not null terminated or anything like that. It's, it's define the length and then here come the bytes. So that's why we've done that. But you can just copy paste these if you only want to use the keyboard and screen like I have. It would be only if you're using file systems or other systems you would need to specify something else. So that's going to open the stream to our screen. 
and next we need to do another command now there's a rather special one and I think this is only for the screen so we'll just paste this in as well um, and here it is if I just show you this here in the manual so video pages are not displayed on screen unless the user explicitly requests this this request is done by a special function called to the channel blah 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 so this is what you have to sort of do you have to read through that you have to grind through the manual read it make sure you understand what you're doing at least until you can get it working once you get it working you just forget about it you create your sample commands to get your screen working once you're happy with them you just leave them alone so yeah as I say I had to have to read quite extensively through the manual to get this example working so there we go that will set up our screen and then what we also want to do is we want to load up the keyboard and we do that in the same way we specify the keyboard name which is here this is going to be stream 11 and then we run the open stream command which I've written here or which I haven't written here that's rather poor let's get that in sorry about that so the open stream command is very similar again okay so I've put a little comment here describing what you need to do but again it's just an RST and a number and um, I will just show you how you know what those numbers mean again if you go back to that manual you'll see there's this page here kernel specifications and here are all the functions so you can see function one is open channel and then if you look at my example function one and then if you look at number 16 read write or toggle ESXOS variable and here you can see I'm using function 16 function 16 um, as I say you may see the you would see these in other tutorials and other sample code as EXOS 16 but again I don't like to use those kind of macros in basic code I like to see really what the um, really what the Z80 is doing and then worry about you know making things easier for myself once I understand what the system's doing so just just excuse my um, stubbornness on that so our, inter our initialization is now done so what we're going to do is we're going to do a few um, a few commands here I'm just going to copy paste these in these are actually a direct copy of my previous example uh, this was lesson four I believe so nothing new here we're going to print a hello world message we're going to wait for a key press we're going to show what the user pressed and then we're going to print it to the screen now one thing I haven't worked out how to do and it may not even be possible I don't know how to get back to enterprise basics so I'm just going to crash the machine di halt stops interrupt and then waits for an interrupt that's impossible the machine will just stop so that's just to stop the, the machine doing some crazy crashing it will just halt with the screen showing the same message and then we need uh, the message we're going to show um, these are 255 terminated and that's because we're using the same example um, print string routine that I showed in my previous example again lesson four so um, that's what that is and then all we need now is our new line command so you can see you use character 13 character 10 just like on the Amstrad CPC and then the final thing I think we should need is um, define the end of the file and the reason we're doing that is because we need to know the length of the file here for the header so file end minus file start will, def will give us the length and that allows um, WinApe to build the file that the enterprise will be happy with so if we compile that right what a this silly problem there I have to actually save my file because I'm using a relative path so if we just do an assemble and we have some errors oh dear not done a very good job have I okay I've obviously I've obviously missed some copy pasting there so yes I forgot a couple of my commands let's just um, put them in here now these are the wait character command and the print character command which are again copied from my lesson um, four. Now all I've done here is I've put push bc, push hl, push de. This is to protect these um, registers from being changed by the operating system. I don't know how well the, how the enterprise operating system works well enough to know if I need to do this. So I've just put them in for safety to make sure the example works okay. So there. It was very silly. I've put the file end in the wrong place. So 
some of my file is missing there. Let's try again. Hello world, and we press a key, and it tells us the key. So there we go. So our example works fine. Now I should I I, I said incorrectly that um, wake char and print char were copied from lesson four. They aren't quite copied from lesson four. They're modified from lesson four. So let's just look at those modifications here. So you can see here we're using this RST6 command, which, as we said before, is a call to the XOS operating system. So let's have a look at what that actually does. So I'll just move this over here. So RST6 calls a function, and the function is number 5. And so if we go up here, and 5 is read character, which is what the wait character command does. And then number 7 is print character. So if we go down here, write character, there we go. And you can actually use these exact same commands to read and write from files, which is why I said that the screen, the keyboard, are treated exactly the same way as every other stream in the enterprise operating system, which is a very, very clever way of doing things. And it seems to work very nicely. I can't comment on speed. I, I would be going to the direct hardware when I write my Chibi Acumens game for the enterprise. But for, for these basic examples, they seem to make things really nice and really easy for the beginner to use. The only pain is you have to know the right commands to get um, to get things set up. So as I say, you got to read through the manual and, and keep reading it until you understand it and have a go. But it, it does seem to be relatively easy to get things working. So, so there we go. Hopefully that's shown you a little bit about the enterprise. I, I think it's definitely a system you want to look at. It seems to have been a massively under um, underappreciated system but now well, thanks to emulation we can all have a go with it even if we can't get our hands on the real hardware um, hopefully you, you'll think about having a look at it maybe you want to try programming it as well I'm planning to try and um, port my game to it and in the future hopefully I'll be able to make my other games for it by default so um, there we go let me know what you think and also if you know of another really interesting gate bit system that you think I should be looking at as well let's um you say, hey, well, you know, if you're programming the Spectrum, you should be programming this. This is far better than the Spectrum. Please let me know. I'll have a look. Thanks for watching today and goodbye.